The Cows, Gusty Renegade, in for another program to share constructive information uh, on what racism is and how it works. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning into the broadcast. Uh, I hope it has been constructive. Hopefully, you are not uh, wasting your time here at The Cows. Uh, again, just want to make sure I announce uh, upcoming programs. Uh, we will be right back tomorrow. Saturday, March 28th, um, Aisha Sekmet, she'll be our guest uh, on Sunday evening, hip-hop artist. She talks a lot about racism. Uh, she'll be real interesting. Looking forward to having her on the broadcast. That is, again, Sunday, March 27th. Uh, showtime will be 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, that's tomorrow uh, evening, afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, and we'll be right back uh, on Monday. Uh, Monday we'll have Jesse Daniels. Uh, she is the author of Cyber Racism. Uh, she'll be on the program uh, this Monday, 5 p.m. Eastern, uh, 2 p.m. Pacific. Um, hmm, I'm having a issue here with my switchboard. I can't... Uh, it's not pulling up who, uh, who called in, so I can get to our guest. Um, hoping that will be corrected shortly. Uh, hopefully by the time I finish the introduction uh, for our guest, switchboard will be straight, and uh, I can pull him on the show line here. Uh, our guest for today's program, he was recommended uh, by Dr. Elaine Kim. She's a professor at uh, UC Berkeley. She was on the program just maybe two weeks ago. Um, she was hanging out, and she talked a lot about a specific piece that he wrote, um, our guest for today's program, and that piece, White Space, Black Space. Um, real interesting post. Uh, he breaks down. Um, well, we'll get to it in the program. I'll make sure we start with that one so he can explain it in the program. But that's how I found out uh, about our guest for today's program. He's also written several other uh, blog posts uh, as well as a book that is coming out this year, um, I can, <laughs> I'm really struggling right now because I can't, uh, I can't get my switchboard to pop up here. Um, it's, uh, it's really holding up progress. Wow. Um, Okay, I uh, should have my switchboard uh, and our guest for today's program. Uh, the book is Stare in the Darkness, Rap, Hip Hop, and Black Politics. Um, our guest for today's program, he is an assistant professor of political science at John Hopkins University, uh, Dr. Lester Spence. Uh, Dr. Spence, are you with us? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sir, loud and clear. Oh, excellent, excellent, excellent. Outstanding. Again, forgive my uh, difficulties. We had some uh, switchboard issues. I hope it's solved and uh, we can roll with the program. Um, thank you for sharing some of your Saturday afternoon with us. Always appreciate that. Could you, could you share with our listeners a little bit about yourself and the work that you do? Okay. I'm, um, as a side note, I'm actually chilling in D.C. outside like uh, the cherry blossom festival is just starting. So rather than being inside where they're singing the Ch Japanese and, the, Ch and um, the American National Anthem, I'm like, okay, that probably wouldn't be a good look for your listeners. So I'm, I'm like chilling outside. So if you hear people screaming in the background or people saying like, pose, pose, you know, it's just, it's just, just where I am. It's not, you know, it's not your listeners, it's me. It's where, I, you know, where I'm chilling at right now. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, so I'm, uh, I grew up in and around Detroit and uh, attended Michigan for undergraduate and graduate school. And I study political science. And a lot of the questions that I seek to ask and then answer were really, um, are really kind of an outgrowth of my experiences growing up in Detroit. And then to a lesser extent, my experiences in, uh, as an undergrad at, at the University of Michigan dealing with, uh, dealing with racism and dealing with racial difference, dealing with class politics both between blacks and whites, um, and then also within black communities, right? So, um, you know, kind of, I'm a, I'm a post-civil rights era kid, grew up in, uh, born in 69, 
So I was one of the first people to be, you know, to be able to take advantage in some ways of this quote unquote post civil rights era. And um, I just try to, what I try to do in my teaching and in my writing is take, um, is try to make sense of, of, the, of the milieu we're actually living in and, and to do so in a way that people can really, really understand and then that political scientists can use to theorize about um, political processes both here and abroad. Okay. Okay. Some of your blog, actually quite a bit of your blog uh, this week, and uh, I caught that you, uh, you enjoy having discussions on racism uh, and having people uh, even question what you say and all that, and we love doing that here at the Cal, so we should have some uh, fantastic uh, dialogue over the next few minutes. Um, this program... Uh, the cows context of white supremacy, I have unfortunately concluded that we are in a global system of racism, white supremacy, and the definition that I use for both racism and white supremacy is as follows. Uh, a global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Uh, do you believe such a system exists, and do you think that definition is accurate? Uh, so that's, ne that's Neely Fuller's definition. Uh, and I think a good question that I, that I have, and I actually remember having a discussion, I think it was with um, Harry Allen about this, uh, the one question is 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 what that how what is not only about whether that dis, that definition describes the world accurately right whether there's a number of whether it's political phenomena social phenomena, phenomena economic phenomena um, that we can actually understand using that definition the question is to what extent is that definition falsifiable right so. What would have to happen to actually disprove that definition? And now, if you can't find something that can say, okay, well, if this were to happen, this definition would be false. If you can't find that, what that means is that we, what we have isn't quite a definite, isn't a, isn't a definition that works in a way that, in a way that social science works. Rather, it's something like, um, it's something to akin to the way re religion works. So that's why I think about it empirically. What I think about it practically is that it has the tendency to give people classify it has a tendency to give too much power to people, not enough power to institutions, and then it tends to give too much power to people classified as whites, and it kind of robs non-whites of, uh, of agency. So those, uh, I guess those are my ideas about it in a nutshell. But with that said, when I first came across Neely Fuller's work, this is Wow, I guess, I guess about 20 years ago. It was really, really fruit for me, fruitful for me to think about. It really helped me think about race and racism as a global system as opposed to something that was just domestic. Okay. I had a couple questions about uh, different, different terms that you used, but I did want to make sure I had clarity. Um, do you believe that that definition is accurate, uh, and do you believe that we are in a system of racism, white supremacy? Um. I, I think that white supremacy uh, more at, is the is the best term to describe how uh, the best term to describe the oppression that black people are contemporary can, that are that, 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 that's my turn to get messed up. Uh, I think that definition describes what black people are dealing with, but again, it, it robs black people of agency. It doesn't really focus on institutions, and at some level, it's not falsifiable. So um, if you talk about the known universe, I mean, what you're doing is, in effect, replacing God with white supremacy. And granted, I'm a heathen, but um, I'm not sure that, that, in some ways, worshiping white supremacy is a good look. Okay. Um, yeah, we should just, we can, that, I, I figured this was going to happen. Um, before, I don't the folks not see or anything, is that correct? Say it again, brother. I can't hear you. You are a black male. Is that correct? Yes, I am. Clarify for folks. 
Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, um, to, um, I guess, address a couple things. Number one, um, you said that when you talk about racism, white supremacy, and you white supremacy, it robs black people of agency. Um, no, can you no, explain? Uh, no, no. Um, I didn't say when you talk about racism and white supremacy, it robs black people of agency. When you talk about it in the way Neely Fuller does, you rob black people of agency. Right? So, I mean, I write about racism. Can you explain? Uh, white. Uh, well, if you say that it's the most, what Neely Fuller argues in essence is that white supremacy is the most powerful force in the known universe. Is that, isn't that right? Am I misreading that? He has concluded that the system of racism, white supremacy, is the strongest force amongst people in the known universe. Yes, I yeah, think amongst he has concluded people, that. Yeah, amongst people in the known universe. So it's more powerful than love? More powerful than hope? I think that would be his conclusion, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. So does that make sense to you? I mean, so, so let's say, let's say that's ac- if, if that if that's accurate. If that's actually accurate, mm-hmm. then what are we talking? <laughs> what, are, what are we? What are we having this conversation about? Why don't we just bow down, <laughs> right? Just suck it up and take it. <laughs> Why don't we just do that? <laughs> you feel me? I think uh, my understanding is uh, of Mr. Fuller, and I could be incorrect, but he has been a guest on yeah. this program. Uh, yeah. Is that he, he has unfortunately concluded that of white supremacy, which is the most dominant motivating force amongst people in the known universe, but that should that incorrect situation that non-white people and white people, presumably, should yeah. be working to correct because that problem can be solved. I think that is the conclusion Mr. Fuller has come to, and I think his conduct would he could he says all the time if I thought uh, this could not be fixed there would be no point talking about it I would just you know do what white people say but I think he believes this problem can be fixed as do I but I don't think he feels that not acknowledging the power that the white people who believe in and practice white supremacy uh, that they exert worldwide that would be further contributing to the problem because you're not telling the truth I think. Well, yeah. So, so there's a. So there's a, what I'm suggesting is that there's a, a a middle ground. So I acknowledge white supremacy exists. I you know, again. I so another part of it that's important is I don't think it resides. It resides in people, but institutions actually do much more. Institutions are more than just a bunch of people with a name on it, right? So GM, for example, is more than just a bunch of people that make cars. GM actually works as GM to do some things that just a whole bunch of people can't necessarily do, right? But that's, a, that's another thread, um, you know, that I hope we can come back to in this or another conversation. But the thing is, is that, so I acknowledge racism and white supremacy exists, but the thing is, is that, is that looking at the logic of it, and again, not looking at how um, Brother Fuller or um, Brother Allen or the people who believe this or you work, but looking at the logic of the idea, right, it doesn't make sense. It, it, it doesn't seem logical to me to, on one hand, argue that this thing is the most powerful force in the known universe, and then at the same time say that there's something that we can do to correct it, right? I mean, because you can't, if it's been the most powerful force in the known universe, how would we possibly predict things like Rosa Parks deciding not to sit on a bus, right? How would we predict uh, something like a group of kids in uh, Oakland, California, deciding to follow the police, right? And then, and then using that to actually become, and then, and then that organization becoming so powerful, even though it's a bunch of kids, that the United States government thinks that they're like public enemy number one. How would we predict that type of black agency, that type of, uh, of ability to change not just how we practice democracy here, but to change our ideas and our practices globally, how could we use that theory of white supremacy to predict this type of black resistance? Um, my response would be that any time you have, we were talking about a problem, 
Um, yeah. The system of white supremacy is a problem for yeah. all non-white people worldwide in the known universe. Anytime you have a problem, I think you, you should logically expect that the people who are being adversely affected by that problem are going to respond in some way, whether it's QEP Newton, Bobby Seale saying we're going to follow the police, whether it's Rosa Park saying I'm not going to get none of these white people as I see, whatever the response is, you should, I think, logically expect that non-white people, victims of race, are going to respond in some manner. Uh, even if white supremacy racism is the most dominant force in the universe. In fact, if that's true, I would expect more people to be responding to that if that's the most dominant force amongst people on the planet. That would be my... Um, so, I did... I wasn't, I wasn't clear in terms of the, the agency piece in terms yeah. of how non-white people lose agency by acknowledging, if it's true that white yeah. supremacy is the most dominant force on the planet. Because you can't use it, because the end result of that is kind of like, um, so when I, was, when I was in Michigan as an undergrad, we used to bring uh, like a bunch of, I was involved in black student union politics, and we used to bring, there was this moment where we bring all these conspiracy theorists up to speak, right? Um, like Steve Coakley was the one who was, who was the most prominent. He was a low-level official and uh, the Harold Washington um, regime in Chicago when he got fired for making uh, anti-Semitic comments. And then he started to make his living basically giving speeches about a variety of different conspiracies who are basically running, running black life. And these things would be really interesting for us to listen to, but, in the, uh, but what we'd ask at the, at the end that he'd never really have a, a proper response for is like, okay, we know this stuff, what do we do now? So you're basically arguing that, you know, our lives are controlled by the secret force of these, you know, these people who are smarter than us, have more resources than us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, more, you know, uh, more tactical than we are, and there's nothing we can do about it. So what do we do about it? And his whole response was, well, you now you know, and no one's half the battle. I'm like, okay, this isn't G.I. Joe. We're not talking about a cartoon. You know, we're talking about life, right? So that's, that's one thing, and that's practical, right? But then again, theoret but then is, there's a, the a theoretical thing. So... What you suggest is that any time you've got power or you've got a people being subjugated, there's going to be a response. Yeah, sure. But there are a number of different ways to respond, right? So, so let's take an example of gas. So people have been saying that, you know, so gas has gone back to like kind of normal prices. But let's go back a year, maybe a year, two years ago, when gas was rising significantly, you know, higher than we'd ever really seen it in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the modern era. And people would say, wow, well, if gas goes up to $4, you're going to see people riding in the street. Then gas went up to $4, and people just kind of took it, right? There are a number of different ways to respond. So you could imagine people, maybe people would ride, ride in the street if gas goes up to, say, 450 But maybe they'd end up beating each other up instead. Maybe they kill themselves. Maybe they, there's a whole set of practices that they'd engage in, right? So yeah, you could say that, well, anytime a group of people are subjugated, there's going to be a response. But there are a number of different ways to respond. To respond the question is, is what, what role does uh, resistance particularly play in that response? And, 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 and if you don't have a role for agency, if you don't have a role that says people actually have the ability to resist, have the ability to fight this, have the ability to come up with a different type of identity that doesn't necessarily fit with the way that whites in this case think about us, then, you know, then, then not only is it not helpful for us in practical politics, but it, it also really doesn't work much in social science because people are a lot more complicated than that. Does that make sense? Um, well, I, I understand what you said. Um, yeah. I guess my view would be that I have seen a lot of examples of non-white people who have concluded that white people dominate the known universe uh, and are dedicated to mistreating non-white people. Uh, however, they hold that belief and they actively work to replace 
that system of injustice with a system of justice. I think Mr. Fuller is one. Yeah. I think he gives yeah. a lot of practical suggestions for things non-white people can do to try to correct this problem. Uh, I think I make an effort to do that on my program. Um, yeah. I know I, I think there are a significant number who don't seem to be don't seem to have lost any agency while believing that we are in a system of white supremacy. So that that would be my response. But I could be incorrect. Um, I guess before I, I wanted to move to some of the pieces, but before we go there, I, I guess I did want to get a, a definition for because uh, you used the term institution. Can you explain what you mean when you say institution? Oh, uh, so an institution is a set of, yeah, it's going to be kind of, let me see if I can come up with a nice little blurb. An institution is a set of rules, um, norms, um, practices that people create in order to make certain types of processes uh, standard and normal such that uh, such that let me see and there's an energy component to it such that these practices and uh, these practices do not have to occur with a significant amount of uh, with a significant amount of energy you know so I'll, so I'll give you an example so um, so it's so at Johns Hopkins let's just say that all Johns Hopkins did was teach kids you know my, my university my university let's say, that's an institution let's say all it does is teach kids there's a set of rules and standards by which once Johns Hopkins is created as an institution it allows the teaching of kids to occur in a routine-like fashion, where you know if you were to visit, if we were to visit Johns Hopkins um, this week, somebody would be teaching kids. If you were to visit it next week, they'd be teaching kids. If you were to visit the week after that, they'd be teaching kids. Not only would they be teaching kids, they'd be teaching kids in exactly the same way, using the exact same mode. Right now, imagine that instead of Johns Hopkins, we just talked about some people who wanted to teach kids, right? Just, just some people and what they, they wanted to teach kids. You visit them week one, right? Maybe, maybe they're teaching kids. You visit them week two, they're teaching kids, but maybe they're not teaching kids the same way that they did uh, in week one. You, teach them, you see them in week three, they might not be teaching the kids the same way they're teaching and they taught them in week two or one, and then you see them in week four, and they might not be teaching them because they don't necessarily have, it's not necessarily routinized. It's just a bunch of people that's coming together. Hmm. Okay. Um, the reason I ask that is because I have observed in conversations on racism, white supremacy, uh, white people and non-white people, uh, they will say, institutional racism or yeah. institutions, institutional structures, uh, I found that that is a way of talking about, ultimately, white people who practice racism, white supremacy, without talking about any person, per se, that there are just rules in place, laws in place, uh, they're, just, they're just things in place that produce racism, white supremacy, and I have found that that is, it's not accurate and it's not what you just described is people, people doing things, people not doing things, specifically for an institution, what you just described, I think, is a group of people who coordinate their time and energy to achieve a certain desired result. That's what you that's what to me it sounded like you're talking about. I may have misheard you. If I did, please correct me. But if that's what we're talking about, then I think if we're gonna talk about racism, white supremacy, we should talk about the white people who put these structures in place, maintain and refine these structures, rules, uh, whatever, patterns that result in racism, white supremacy. I think that would be extremely helpful uh, in the process of replacing white supremacy with justice to make sure that we keep in mind there are people who are responsible for this, and these people are white people who believe in and practice racism. I could be incorrect, yeah. but... Well, you don't, you don't, uh, well, you don't ignore people, right? I mean, because you don't, 
you, you don't ignore people. You have to look at people's attitudes and you look at people's behaviors, right? You have to do that. I mean, I study. One of the things I study is racial attitudes, right? But study, simply studying individual attitudes and behaviors doesn't really get us close to, doesn't really do all the work in understanding how racism functions, right? So, um, I mean, so, I'm trying to figure out an example that works. So let's take something like GM. If we, if somehow everybody associated with GM died and they were replaced with another set of people tomorrow, would GM function any differently? Is that rhetorical or? No, no, it's not rhetorical. Would oh, they okay. function any okay. differently? Uh, I'm sure you would have a change, uh, a pretty big change if everybody who runs the organization known as GM died and they were replaced with a totally new set of people. Uh, however, uh, what I would say, in the system of racism, white supremacy, uh, I think you would observe uh, a staggering amount of consistency because it seems that white people have got this system down to where you can replace individual or even sometimes groups of racist men and women they can be replaced wholesale and the system continues moving right along sometimes you can even come and replace these white people with non-white people and it continues to roll right along i think why uh, did, wh why would gm so why would gm be different right i mean so what you what you, what you what you just explained to me what you just described to me is, so, is something institutional it can't be people because if it was people, then if you replaced people with another set of people, the thing would be different. After it, you know, you understand what I'm saying? It can't possibly be people. Because if, if it's just people, that, the answer would be just swapping people out. Right? Well, I think, I think, I think, and this is why my definition, I want to read my definition one more time. My definition of racism, white supremacy is a global system of people who classify yeah. themselves as white, I have concluded the institution is the individuals who say that they are white people. Those people themselves are the institution. Those people themselves, in their minds, they, in their thinking, in their perceptions of the world, they carry the rules, logic, and structures that are responsible for racism, white supremacy. So just taking, removing yeah. a white person and replacing them with another white person, you have not done anything. You are just uh, switching interchangeable parts uh, because all of the white people in the system of racism, white supremacy, um, they carry a part of that structure with them. As I, my definition says, they yeah. are the system. They yeah, are the so, structure. I could so, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, no. So I'm trying to work with the logic. So, uh, so how do people become white? And, and actually, and I haven't read. I, I got full of this book actually on my um, like in my office. I haven't looked at it in a little bit. How is it? How is it that people? What happens? By what process do people become white? Um. <laughs> I am a non-white person, so I am not the best person to ask. I want to make sure I, I get that out loud and clear. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> I am a non-white yeah. person. I am yeah. the last, and specifically a black male, so I'm like the yeah. last person in the nation. That said, I think it is a process that begins, I suspect, much earlier than we think. Um, yeah. I just had Dr. Joe Fagan on the program, and he talked about in his book he's how, like, oh, yeah, but he's an admitted racist, old school racist. Um, he said in his book, he talked about how white people will tell racist jokes in the home, and their kids will hear this stuff. Well, they'll, they'll say things that are racist white supremacists, and very small kids, kindergarten kids, he was talking about, five years old, they will hear this stuff. And they will pick it up and start saying it at school. And he had an example in his book where a five-year-old, he had gone to school and was calling presumably all the black kids nigger, and he got in trouble. Yes. And his parents were looking to curtail the way that they made racist comments around that child until the child could figure out 
oh, not supposed to say this publicly. Got it. It's okay to think this way. Just make sure you're yeah. not saying this publicly right. in school. Right. I That's think right. becoming a white person is a process that is inevitable as long as the system of white supremacy exists uh, and white meaning racist. That process is inevitable as long as this system exists uh, for the people who classify themselves as white. Uh, it's every day. It's all areas of activity. Everything that we, uh, everything around us is structured to make sure that that happens. All areas of people activity are designed to make sure that that happens. Uh, but I so, could be wrong. And again, I'm not yeah. white, so I could be wrong. Well, I mean, so the reason I ask is because, uh, is because there are populations that in point A, right? So, for example, the Irish don't really become white until the beginning of the 20th century, really, right? Um, in some ways, Jews don't really become white until kind of around this. In some ways, they don't really become white until around the same time. I mean, um, and we don't see white, we don't see the language of whiteness before uh, the enslavement of Africans, right? So, so how do we talk about how people, the process by which a group of people that we think of as white now, how do we think of them as actually, you know, by what process do they actually become white? I remember talking to a Bosnian kid. I was doing some research in St. Louis, and I was giving surveys out, and this kid was like, I can't, I don't know the answer to this question. And the question was the race question. Like, what race do you consider yourself, right? But this kid was Bosnian. He was like, I don't know what the answer was. This kid was as white as the day is long. I mean, you know, for me, I was like, well, how do you see yourself? He said, I see myself as Bosnian. Now, What's going to happen to that kid is, it may have happened already because it's been some years since I surveyed him, is that he's going to begin to think of himself as white. But how does that happen? If we just look at what people do, again, we're giving these people a whole great, uh, like a significant amount of power because there's a great deal of, there has to be a significant amount of coordination. Such, I mean, think about the coordination involved that, to make it such that kids, like uh, white kids in kindergartens across the country, just kind of sort of know that black people are niggers. And then some of them just kind of sort of know you're not supposed to talk about that in public. You're only supposed to talk about it in the private. Think about that. I mean, so that's, for, that's why for me, again, studying racism is important, studying white supremacy, acknowledging that it's white supremacy is important, right? I mean, so one of the things that Fuller gets right is, I think it's Fuller, is he talks about how um, black people or non-whites in general don't really have, it's like to the extent we actually practice discrimination or what some others might call racism, it's not fully functional because we just don't have the same type of power that our white counterparts do, right? I mean, talking about that stuff is important. But again, institutions are not simply collections of people. You know, GM, and GM operates the exact same way you say white supremacy does, in that if we, if everybody affiliated with GM were to die tomorrow and be replaced, I mean, assuming you don't replace them with children, GM would pr still produce cars, still produce cars the exact same way, still would, uh, would function, they, uh, would still um, design their, their plants and structure their labor in the exact same way. That's institutions. That's not people. Can you have an institution without people? Um, can you have an institution without people? No, you can't. But institutions do things that people of themselves cannot. So right. you take ten. So again, I, I, I use the educational example again. It, it's a perfect example. You take a school. A school is an institution. You take a, a hundred people who work in a school who want to teach kids, then you take, on the other hand, 100 people who do not have a school, who do not have an institution, but want to teach kids. There's going to be a significant difference in how the school teaches kids in their quality and quantity than how that 100, how that 100 100 people, on the other hand, deal with, uh, try to do the same task. Hmm. I agree totally. I want to uh, get to some of your, your essays as well, but I agree totally with what you just said, particularly with the example about the school. And I guess for my, for my listeners, again, my program, we're not about uh, dogma and 
react to what's being presented and decide for yourself. Um, author White, she's been on the program. Uh, Professor Broadkin, uh, she is the author of How Jews Became White Folks. She's coming on the program next month. I make an effort to study white people extensively. Uh, for a long time, I've really only had white people uh, come on the show uh, to study how this system is put together, which you yeah. just said. Think about that. The fact that kindergarten children across the nation, really across the world, understand I am not, if I'm white, I'm not a nigger. Yeah, Those that's right. are niggers. That yeah, takes right. an extraordinary amount of coordination for that to be happening worldwide, and I submit it is. And white people have come on this program and shared information to confirm, yes, that is happening, and yes, that is an unbelievable amount of coordination. I agree with your distinction about the difference between having a school where you have people that are dedicated to teaching and just a uh, motley crew of people that say they want to teach and maybe it happens, maybe it doesn't, it changes week to week. There's an extraordinary difference when you have people who are organized and coordinated about what they want to do and they take steps every day to make sure that that happens as opposed to another group of people who don't have that organization, who are not coordinated, and they're just going as they go, it's a huge difference. And that's going to play out in uh, efficiency, productivity. And what I'm saying is that in the system of white supremacy, white people have got that coordinated effort to maintain this system like other. In fact, their organization is such, you should just have a group of white people as a photograph in the dictionary when you see institution, organization, it should just be a group of white people, whether it's the Rockefellers, GM, any white group you want, just put them up because right now they are the essence of organization. Yeah. Don't hold a candle to the organizational, uh, institutional <laughs> force that white people flex worldwide every day. It's like comparing Haiti to any white area you want to talk about, Germany, France, U.S., anywhere white people are in comparison to Haiti. That's what it is. That's why their school systems work. Bush school, I was just there this week. That's why the Bush yeah. school looks the way it does, and that's why the non-white schools look the way they do. Organization and white people, bud. <laughs> they are the right. organizers. I heard. Um, I don't, but yeah, like I said, I want to. I definitely want to share because I think you do have a lot of uh, just excellent posts at the blog site. Um, the one, let's start with the one Dr. Elaine Kim dropped on us: white space, black space. Um, can you kind of set that up for folks who haven't read it? And it's linked in the description for this show. If you're listening at Blog Talk Radio, you can click that title, and it'll take you right uh, to the site. So you can read it for yourself. But Dr. Spence, could you uh, could you set that up for us? Um, so I was asked by uh, by uh, Baltimore uh, Magazine to write a piece on self segregation, that is, on black people who you know segregate themselves. Uh, and I really don't really I don't think I didn't think the term had a lot of you know I've, I've heard people talk about that before, but I don't think you know segregation. When I think here segregation, I'm I'm thinking about a political process uh, and an economic process by which a group of people. Um, using institutions, they end up coordinating another group of people off in order to in order to withhold resources. Right? That's not really what black people do. Uh, that's not really what non-whites do. So what I wanted to do instead was talk instead about instead of talking about self segregation, what I wanted to talk about was I actually wanted to make a case as to why blacks specifically and non-whites in general may actually want to create spaces with other people like themselves in some ways away, away from white. And so what I did was I used an example. I used an incident that happened to me the first day of school, what, 2008, first day of the fall 2008 semester at Hopkins, uh, in which I was um, racially harassed, or which I felt I was racially harassed, to uh, talk about why I might want to, for example, join a black fraternity. I'm, I'm a member of uh, Omega Psi Phi. Or how I might want to live in a, might want to send my kids to a predominantly black public school. You know, my kids, I've got five children. Three of my five children attend predominantly black schools. You know, why I might want 
to attend a church. My, and I don't attend church necessarily, but my wife attends a black church. You know, why exactly might black people or non-whites in general want to engage in these practices, right? So I use the example to talk about it. It's got a, um, most of the people who read it really understood where I was coming from. And even in the cases where people didn't like the example I used, I was able to have, like, some really interesting discussions about it and about the way that race is reproduced. They didn't like, what, what example did, did some of the folks not like? Well, um, so one of the challenges, uh, and this is something that Neely fully talks about in his book, um, and others have written about as well, one of the challenges in dealing with examples of racial harassment is that it's often difficult for whites to acknowledge the examples as racial harassment, right? So in this case, for example, so the case I, I wrote about was an instance in which I went to a welcoming event sponsored by the School of Engineering um, because they were setting out free pop, and I was really, really thirsty. I was leaving class. I, I wanted to drink. I asked them if I could come in, come to the event and get a drink, and, and you know, they, they let me do so. And I was at the event kind of chilling on the side, getting ready to leave because I had, I had an appointment that I had to make. And... Then um, a, a staff, I was the only black person there, and as, at some point during the event, a staff person came to me and asked me to, um, to pick up my stuff and move because they needed, the, they needed the table I was at for the students who were actually at the event, at the event quote, unquote, legitimately, although she didn't say this. Um, you know, the legitimately, the legitimately part, she did not say. That's just me reading. Um, so when she said that to me, I was kind of confused because I was getting ready to leave anyway, right? And I asked her what she saw me doing that made her, that made her think that I was kind of sort of staying, right? And she was like, well, I saw you taking stuff out of your bag. Now, I hadn't taken anything out of my bag. I was, you know, I was getting ready to leave. And she was like, well... So I, so I asked her, I said, so what did you see me take out of my bag, right? Now, at this point in time, I'm starting to get heated. I'm still speaking in the quote-unquote king's English, but I'm getting heated. I'm like, what did you see me take out of my bag? And she couldn't answer the question, right? She, so she got really, really huffy, and at that point, I was like, yo, tell me, give me the name, of you, give me your name, and give me the name of your supervisor, right? She wouldn't do it. She wouldn't do it. So um, I'm trying to think about what to do. I'm getting ready to go. Uh, getting ready to go to this appointment, and then the supervisor comes up to me, white guy, and he asked me what the mm -hmm. problem was, you know, and I was like, listen, you know, I know this is, this is the beginning of semester, everybody's working hard, I really appreciate you guys letting me come get some pop, but I think I was rudely treated by one of your staff, then explaining what happened, and he's nodding, right, he's nodding his head, nodding his head, then after that, you know, after I, I gave my spiel, he says, well, you know what, you're going to have to leave, if you don't leave, we're going to call the police. Now, I had told him, again, it's like, how do you get kicked out of a place that you're leaving, right? So, but once he put that on me, I was like, oh, okay, I got you. I feel you. Um, you call the police, and I'm going to wait, and then we'll see what happens, right? So um, when I described that event in the story, a couple of people are like, well, you know, it looks like you were just trying to pick a fight. I mean, I don't understand the big deal was. It seems like you were being rude and disrespectful, right? And that's the thing. It's like, you know, it's one of the challenges is like, okay, how do you explain to whites that this stuff is actually real? You know, because they're like, you know, the, for them it's like blinders, right? So in that case, so in, in, in one of the cases I was talking to the brother, I was like, well, okay, let's assume that I was being rude, right? It's possible to be rude and to be treated, you know, and, and to be uh, racially discriminated against. Right? I mean, you can have racism and black rudeness at the same time. Right? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, but they couldn't even, but you can't even acknowledge it theoretically. I mean, it's hard, hard for people to wrap their heads around. That's why it had to be Rosa Parks, you know, with the bus boycott, right? Because if they chose somebody else, you know, if they chose somebody else, they'd be like, oh, well, they deserved it. Like, no, racism is racism. I don't have to, quote, unquote, I have to act within the, within the law. Right? I have to act lawfully, but there's no law that says I can't be rude. I mean, other professors are rude. So what? I, so for me to be treated 
with respect and dignity and not get the police called on me? I have to actually <laughs> act perfect? Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> right? So that was, yeah, so that was a, yeah, so that was a thing I had to have, you know, I had a couple of discussions about. It's like, well, yeah, okay. You know, I mean, professors as a whole, you know, I, I, I know I wasn't acting rudely, but let's, yeah, let's say I was. What, like a professor hasn't acted rudely to a staff member before? I bet they didn't get the police called on them. So that's what happened. I just, I wanted to highlight because uh, some of the folks listening in, they were, like, he was a professor at that time? You you were a professor and at oh, your... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I, I am a professor. When this happened, I was a professor. I told, I did not tell the staff person I was faculty. So when she was, okay. you know, when she, in my interaction with the staff person, because to be honest, I didn't feel, I thought, I, I thought that this was what was happening, right, that they were, she was trying to kind of jag me. Um, not explicitly because I was black, but just in the, you know, you see a black guy, it's like, okay, he's the one who doesn't belong, and I can just treat him any old way, right? Um, so I didn't, and I didn't want to pull the faculty card out because she should treat me with respect because I'm there and because I'm human, not necessarily because I'm faculty, right? But when the supervisor came, the first thing I wanted to do was set up that I was faculty so he wouldn't just think he was talking to a guy, right? But... But he never even asked to see ID. You know, he never even, and so I talked to the police about it afterwards, and the police were real, were real cool. I mean, they were real cool. And the police was like, well, he just didn't believe you were faculty. He just didn't, you know, he didn't. I'm like, well, what do you mean didn't believe? I, mean, I don't even know what that means. If, if somebody comes up to me on Johns Hopkins campus and says, I'm faculty, I'm not going to, I mean, the whole idea of not being able to not believe and act on that disbelief, that's just kind of, I mean, in a way, that's like whiteness at work. But, yeah, it was just kind of astonishing. Hmm. Again, our guest for today's program, Dr. Lester Spence, uh, who is a professor, I believe, at John Hopkins <laughs> yeah, University. Yeah, yeah I believe um, it too. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you, I just want to make sure I'm hearing correctly. You said when you, you were talking about this piece and you wrote this up, this is uh, – on the blog, which is linked in the program. Uh, you can click it. You can actually uh, get to this uh, piece specifically by just clicking white space, black space, and it will take you directly to this piece. Um, that some people read this and they didn't like that example. They didn't like your story of maybe you being rude and being treated uh, in yeah. a racist manner. Um, yeah. Were some of these people white people who said that they didn't like the example that, you know, hey, uh, Dr. Spence, maybe you were just being rude. Were they white people? Yeah, I'm, ass I'm assuming they were, uh, but I don't know for sure. Okay. Um, so I got, two sets of, I got two sets of emails, emails from people who I'm pretty sure were black or, or were not white, right? So they were like, man, I've gone through this. Man, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've been there before. Yeah, tell it like it is. And, you know, you know I, I was, I'm assuming, I could be wrong, I'm assuming those people are not white. And then a the couple of cases where they're like, man, it just seems to me, I mean, I understand racism, but this example seems to me as somebody who is just, you know, who is just kind of itching for it. I, I just assume those people aren't white. I mean, those people are, are white. Hmm. If these individuals are white, do you think that that could be uh, a conscious and or unconscious act of racism to try to convince non-white people who are experiencing racism that it's something other than racism? Oh wow, that's actually interesting. Um, I never would have I would never would have categorized. I think one function of racism is that it produces ignorance, right? Now, one of the things that I believe that um, that we need to really think about is that racism doesn't just subjugate non-whites. Racism subjugates whites too. Um, because it actually produces ignorance, and ignorance is never uh, is is a tool that is not really a tool of empowerment, right? Um, so I would what I would have said was that racism produced produces a type of a type of anti knowledge that makes whites think that they know um, how the world works when in some ways they really don't, right? But I don't 
I, and I have to think about this one more because then that's an excellent question. I would not have thought of those specific emails as acts of racism. I, I think of them as products of racism that, you know, those of us who are interested in working around this issue have to wrestle with. I don't think of them as acts of racism themselves. And what it might just be is, just be, and this just might be because of the example, because we're talking about people who are sending emails to me. And, you know, and I, I'm not going to get played like that. Um, but I have to think some more about it. Excellent question. Hmm. I, I respect that. Anybody who says I'm willing to, that's what we're about at the program, just willing to think I could be wrong, I could be correct, who knows, but hopefully folks will think about what they've heard. Um, I guess I, I would go back to what I said when we were talking about institutions and systems. Um, the system of racism, I think, is in your face. When those white people come up and you say an instance of racism happened, and those white people come up and say, no, it wasn't. No. That wasn't racism. You would just yeah, agree. Yeah. Yeah. I strongly suspect that, that is the system of racism at work, consciously yeah. and or unconsciously, uh, in trying to convince you that it was anything other than racism, white supremacy. It was you being rude. It was that person had a bad day. They were just stressed. It was hot. We were dehydrated. Yeah. They had something right. else to get to. Anything. Anything. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. they yeah. were practicing racism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I, so go, ahead, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So, so we agree that it was that it's a product of racism, right? So it's just that, yeah, it, it, the question is, is whether they're actively practicing it on me or whether they're just victims themselves. And what I, you know, and what I, and just because it's me. Right, because it's me, I'm like, okay, these guys are victims, because they're not practicing. They're not going to. There's no way in hell they're going to convince me that I <laughs> that I didn't, you know, that I didn't see what I saw, or that what happened didn't, you know, that that what I, what I thought happened was really something else. You know, that's not going to that's not going to happen with me. <laughs> hmm. Did Did you say that? Were these white people? All the people, the supervisor, the the initial person, the female, were these all yeah. white people? Yes. Okay. Yes, they were. Um. Yeah. You. Do you believe that these white people? Uh, well, I guess I want to make sure I'm being oh, yeah. clear. I'm not yeah, yeah. Now the super yeah. No, no, I'm no, no. 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 Well, wait, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. So we're talking about two different groups of people, right? So we're talking about two people who sent me an email. I'm talking about two people who sent me an email. I'm not saying they practice acts of racism and trying to tell me that what happened to me didn't really happen. I'm saying they are like victims of ignorance, and they are promoting that ignorance. But I'm not. I'm I, just because it's me. They're they're quote unquote practicing against practicing practicing it against. Sorry, it's been a long day. Um, I don't I don't think of that as racism. But yeah, I think I think the supervisor and the staff person. Yeah, I think that's a different category. Like yeah, I think they're practicing racism. Okay. I think. I, okay. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, I, yeah. So when that when that when that supervisor sees me and I tell him I'm faculty, when I tell him I'm a faculty member, and that supervisor who I technically outrank, right? Because I'm faculty. He's just a guy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, when he feels not in the system of white supremacy. <laughs> well, I mean, well, I'll put it this way: I'd be really surprised if that guy were still employed. I don't know, but I'd be I, I'd be surprised if. Uh, if he was still employed, but um, but in that instance, you're right. In that in that instance, he has the ability to say, okay, this guy is not who he claims to be, without even asking for proof. He just took it for granted. He didn't. It was like I might as well have not even said it. I might as well have said I'd have been, you know, that I was working, you know, that I was a, I don't know, I was a mail carrier or I was a basket. I could have said anything in that moment. Wow, this is, uh, I never say this, but I suspect excellent, uh, excellent discussion is going down here today at the Cows, Gusty Renegade and Dr. Lester Spence uh, from John Hopkins University enjoying the Cherry Festival, Cherry Blossom Festival, excuse me. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm so thankful that you made that distinction um, because, yeah, I wanted to be distinct about what I'm saying as well. I'm saying yeah. that all of the white people that you... I had contact with the white people yeah. at the event where you were trying to get a can of pop 
and the yeah. white people who sent you these emails, the white, these individuals yeah. that you suspect are white, I'm yeah. saying that these folks, I strongly suspect all of them were consciously practicing yeah. white supremacy. I'm not saying yeah. that this is a product of the system of right. racism. I'm saying That's these right. are conscious acts of racism, white supremacy by individual white people that I suspect are racist. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah, I got uh, and I, I also want to highlight for my listeners, um, this, is, this is why I say white supremacy, most dominant force on the planet. Where, wherever this happened at, um, the white people thought Dr. Spence was doing something incorrect. Dr. Spence thought that these white people were doing something incorrect. The white people, they got an armed force to come and support when they think something is happening incorrectly. Dr. Spence, I don't think, would have had anybody to call and say, hey, these people aren't doing uh, the correct thing. They called the police. I don't know. Do you have anybody that you could have called to come and back you up and get them to leave you alone and give you a soda? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I do. Actually, um, <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, but I didn't. But, but, you, but let's, you but let's somebody... go with that, though. Yeah, yeah, I could have called. Um, I, could, I didn't have the president's number necessarily, but I could have called... Um, I could have called the dean. Um, oh. I could have called okay. one of the deans, and they'd have been like, "Okay, no, nah, this guy." But then, but e but even that, but even that supports your I your idea about because both of those guys are white, right? So I basically had to call somebody white to say, "Well, yeah, this black guy's good." But this is what complicates it, right? So this is what complicates the story, and this gets back to the conversation we had at the beginning. When they call the police, the people who come are black people. They're black police officers, right? So I, if, if I was telling you this story like 10 years ago, or if I was, yeah, like 10, maybe 20 years ago at Michigan, back when I went to undergrad, and stopped yes, at the police was called, right? Mm -hmm. The rest of the story would, you know, you would have written itself. It would have been like, okay, the police would have come. Um, it would have been two white police officers. And what they would have basically done is verified the white story, the white account, and then the black agent would have been sanctioned somehow, right? Um, either I would have been, in this case, either I would have been removed or I would have gotten a ticket or I would have gotten in trouble some way, right? But in this case, it's actually, two black, it's actually two black police officers and a white one, right? So the two black police officers come and the white one, and they, you know, and, and they're told the story, and... They come to me and they get my story, and the white police officer is like dumbfounded, right? He's like, "What? They did what?" I was like, "Um, yeah, they 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 tried to kick me out," and he was like, "And you you you're faculty?" I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I'm faculty. Can I see? Did they ask for your ID? Uh, no. Can I see it? I show them my ID." It's like I, I'm confused. This has never really happened before. Now the two black police officers know what the deal is. They're like looking at each other and they're looking at me and kind of grinning like, okay, yeah, we know what this deal is. Yeah, we know what's going on. Now. We know what's going down. And they end up looking out for me. Right? And they, now, now there's nothing, now, if, again, if we had told this story 20, 20 years ago, that story wouldn't have, wouldn't have had anything but a bad ending. And it's not like the ending here was perfect. But in this case, it was actually two black police officers who came and made sure that I was taken care of, even when it looked, even when it looked like the white uh, supervisor and the white staff person were trying to coordinate a story to basically justify them calling the police on me. Hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, I, I do want to make sure uh, the listeners caught that uh, when I asked Dr. Spence if he had uh, you know, his own security, his own troops, secret army to, to come in and support oh, him that, through yeah, this. Oh, like that. He, um, <laughs> well, I asked you if you had people that you could call to come in oh, and yeah, support you yeah. because of what they were doing, and you said yes, but they were both white people. Very, yeah. very important. Um, that's what I have concluded, too. Uh, if you run into problems, it would be best to have some white people behind you to come and fix things. <laughs> Um, in a system of white supremacy. Um, the second thing, uh, not, uh, several folks have called in and have questions. I'll, I'll hit the phone line as well. But um, I wanted to ask because you, you use the term victim uh, in referencing white people. 
do you think white people are victims of racism, white supremacy? Yeah, they are. Um, because mm. so, so this is what you so what you do is you go back to the ancients, right? You you go back to the ancient um, the ancients and what they wrote, wrote about about humanity, about what our purpose here was, about how we're supposed to create um, promote justice in the universe, and the practices and ideas and attitudes that are required to do that thing. Whites don't possess those things, right? So, so if we can think about it in a really, in a big time sense, it's like whites don't, whites don't possess those things, and they end up being victimized, they end up being a victim as a result. They end up being victims as a result. It's like they're, it's like the universe, it's like they're ignorant of some fundamental things about how people are supposed to treat each other, about how the universe works, right? Uh, and then there's a whole set of practical things that they can't necessarily do, um, or, or that there are a whole set of practical ways in which they're victimized, in that if they rely on a group of non-whites to basically perform certain types of labor for them, it's like there's certain types of labor they themselves don't know how to do, and they're not full humans as a result. So I'll give you an example from slavery. Um, there's a moment right when the slaves are freed, or enslaved Africans are freed, where um, where um, this where a woman is actually a Southern Belle is actually giving her first response to finding out that the that the people that she had enslaved uh, would would be freed and wouldn't be able to take care of her. The first thing she said was, "Oh my God, who's gonna comb my hair?" This woman had never ever combed her own hair because she had enslaved Africans to do it. Now, the enslaved Africans, I'm pretty sure, know how to comb their own hair, right? But she doesn't. I mean, so who's really, so there's a level of victim. If, what would we say about a person, about an adult woman, let's say she's 30, 40 years old, who doesn't know how to comb her own hair? What would we think about that person, right? So you, you take that and you multiply that. There are a whole set of practices, a whole set of attitudes that because whites have bought into this white supremacy thing, they um, they possess and it makes them not fully human. You beat up a you beat up a kid. You take somebody like Emmett Till. You beat him. You beat him to the point where his mother cannot recognize him in a casket because he looked at another woman. What would we call that? I mean, is that person? You know, would we call it people who conducted acts like that, who thought like that? who thought like that, would we call them whole psychologically? Would we call them sane? What would we call that? She's got a bar. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, again, our guest uh, for today's program, uh, Assistant Professor of Political Science at John Hopkins University, Dr. Lester Spence. Um, wow. Um... Uh, many of the white people who've come on this program uh, have stated pretty emphatically that white people are not and cannot be victims of racism, white supremacy. Um, I, I completely agree that white people are not humane, that they <coughs> excuse me, do not qualify uh, as human beings because I believe human beings practice justice. Human beings do not mistreat uh, other human beings. So I definitely think white people do not qualify because they are practicing racism, white supremacy. Um, but I don't think it's accurate to call white people victims of white supremacy. Um, they are not, as the admitted racist known as Tim Wise says, white people are not the targets of the system. So he doesn't, and I agree with him on this, I don't think it's accurate um, to reference white people as victims of white supremacy, but I, I also think two, two critical things. Number one, uh, I think this is a pattern that I'm beginning to notice uh, that I just picked up today hearing you. The individuals who reference white people as victims, the effect is that the white people that they think are victims are no longer complicit, no longer culpable. They are viewed as being also victims, that they also have been duped by this. They are not 
practicing participants of racism. They are victims of racism. That's going to be um, one thing that I point out from net, this point forward as to why I yes. don't want white people referenced as victims because it removes them being complicit agents in this system. And at minimum, if they're white, they should be suspected at minimum. Not a victim. They should not be thought of as a victim of racism. At minimum, they should be thought of as racist white supremacists. Uh, the second critical point would be, I think this is the, I, even got, I can go with this, this is the second time a non-white person has made a metaphor using slavery to relate to white people and talk about difficult times and white people using slavery as a metaphor. I find that fascinating, uh, and I even have the sound clip for the first time that that happened on this program, and it's a quick one, 20 seconds, but I want people, non-white people, really think about that. Slavery, referencing slavery and using slavery as a metaphor to talk about how white people are having a tough time. This is the sound clip. When slavery ended, slaveholders were in a horrible, horrible situation. Um, from their point of view, they're like, crap, we have... <laughs> I, had to, I had to pause because I didn't think I heard you correctly. I, was, I understand why you're laughing. Uh, that original guest, non-white female, the Oreo Experience, OreoExperience.com. Um, <laughs> Well, wait, so let, me, so let me back up a second. Let me back up a yes, second. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What would you call a 40-year-old woman who doesn't know how to comb her own hair? 40-year-old white woman? Yeah. What would, you, what would you call that person? Would you call them, I mean, would you call them sane? Would you call them fully functioning? What would you call them? If you don't, if somebody who doesn't know how to comb their own hair, would you call them fully functioning? I would call that person a 40-year-old suspected racist who cannot comb her own hair. So would you call that, I didn't ask whether they were suspected racist, I asked, would you call that person fully functioning? Well, the first question you asked was, what would you call that person? That's what I would oh, call thank it. Oh, thank second you. So, okay, so what would you call that person, yes, yeah, second question was, would you call that person fully functioning? Fully, what do you mean fully functioning? I mean, well... So a forty a forty year old person should be able to engage if they're fully functioning. They should be able to engage in a whole range of activities, right? So if they're okay. fully functioning. They should be able to take. The, they should be able to bathe themselves. They should be able to clothe themselves. They should be able to find a means of employment. They should be able to uh, to I, if they can't grow their own food, they should be able to get their own food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? I mean, mm -hmm. would you agree with that or disagree? Well, and. See, this, that's why this program, context of white supremacy. As long as we're in a system of white supremacy, if I am a white person, I don't have to know a whole lot. I might not have to do a whole lot because I am white. Uh, other white people will assist me in getting things done, and I will have non-white people. I can make them do all the things that I don't want to do or don't know how to do, as long as the system of white supremacy exists. So I'm not but, really but, but required. We've got, but, but, we, but we've got a big stand, but we've got a greater standard, right? The ancients, again, the ancients actually provide us. You know, we talk about art, we're talking about promotion of justice, etc. There's a set of standards. We're not talking about what white people do, what white people's standards are. We're talking about the set of standards by which, mm -hmm. by which you will be judged when you die, right? Mm -hmm. uh, combing hair isn't in there. The ancients don't talk about combing hair at all. But there are a whole set of practices that they talk about, that, the stand, that those are the standards. It's not like these, mm -hmm. there are these white supremacy standards and there are standards. No, there are the standards by the okay. standards, Right? Right. So, do, do you? So, are there these universal standards that upon which we fight for justice, or are they not? I agree. I, I agree one hundred percent by standards. Uh, by any any individual who is concerned about justice, if they if we set up a criterion that is based on justice, people not being mistreated, people getting the help that they need, 
for yeah. sure. White people fall way short. I agree 1,000%. Uh, of, of those standards, yes. And they, and they fall short of those standards because of what they practice, right? Yes. Because yes. they practice yes. racism, right? Yes. Because, yes. because they fall short of those standards, they are victimized. Now, they're not, now don't put me in the, uh, in the category as, a, as an Oreo because I'm making a different set of claims. I'm not saying that, that wow, you know, that woman is jacked. Just, she's not as, she's jacked just like the person that she set free. No. But I'm going back to the idea of black agency and saying that there are some things that black people have and have always had because we have always lived up to or at least tried to live up to those universal standards while whites because of white supremacy, have not. And that makes them victims. Now, again, that does, does that mean there are a whole set of practices? I mean, so now what, what, what I say when I say that is different than what I imagine the girl you laughed at is saying. But that makes them victims. If they can't practice, if they can't practice the standards that will lead them to create a just universe, because of some system they created that's all wrong and all messed up, then, then they're victims. Whether they do it consciously or unconsciously. Hmm. Well, I, I could be incorrect. I hope folks listening in um, evaluate what, what's being heard, because Gus could be wrong, so I don't want you to follow me just because you know, it's my program. I'm, I'm pretty ignorant and have been misinformed. Uh, and I'm not a professor, so, you know, hey, doctor, let's just... <laughs> um, there you go. But, uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I do, I do want to make sure I get this point out, that I think it's very important to note that the white people who believe in and practice racism, white supremacy, the evidence would suggest that they are not concerned with justice. They are not concerned with my eye. That is, that is right. not in any way in their agenda for what they're trying to produce. What they're trying right. to produce is racism, white supremacy, and they have pulled it off uh, in spectacular fashion, I might add. Um, I think if we were in court and we were talking about a rapist and we had the person that he raped, I don't think people would be saying this rapist is also a victim of rape because he's damaged himself, he's not holding up to universal standards, uh, he's also a victim of rape. I don't think people would talk about uh, a perpetrator of rape in that manner. I think they would talk about that person. This is a perpetrator. This is a criminal. That's the only language they would use. They would not. Oh, brother, you know. Oh, come on now, brother. You know that's not right. You know there are all types of people. In fact, a number of people who fight in criminal justice issues. They're like, listen, okay. There are a number of people who are being uh, penalized for like the drug crimes, right? Right, uh, like drug crimes. We talk about drug crimes. There are a number of people who are engaged in the drug game because there aren't really legitimate, there aren't legitimate um, uh, modes of employment in the cities they practice it in, right? There are a number of times where people who committed crimes, like crimes of, uh, of violence against people, where they're like, well, wow, so-and-so, he's got a, you know, he lives in a battered home or he's, grow or, or he's had a battered environment or, you know, he's, he's had to deal with abuse himself. Now, this isn't, now, again, this is, not the, um, well, no, I, I, no, I leave it there. I mean, so what you're saying is that, is that, the, is that the only way that people talk about people who commit crimes is as people who, are, who commit crime as opposed to people who themselves have been victimized and, I, and, I, and I, I were victimized by it. And I say that's not right. Hmm. The the example that you that you cited right there, um, yeah. I think it's problematic because that example is saturated with racism, white supremacy. We're not talking about white people who are caught up uh, selling drugs and incarcerated as judge, uh, former superior court judge of Orange, of Orange County, Judge yeah, yeah. Jim P. Gray, who was on this program. He said. All of the guns in the war on drugs are pointed at non-white people and black people specifically. That's right. He said that. That's so right. that example yeah. is problematic for a myriad of reasons. When we get to talking about white people and racism, and white supremacy, um, I, I, I think the rape example so, is apropos. 
because I've never heard anyone reference a perpetrator of as a victim of rape. It just doesn't have connecting with this person and attempting to say, you know, this is a human being too. He did something wrong, but we're trying to, you know, get him help. I don't hear people also say, well, this is also a victim of rape. Yeah. When we're talking yeah. about racism, white supremacy, yeah. and we're talking about white people, it I does, think it's it very ha- important. It, it doesn't happen as often as it doesn't happen as often as we would like, right? In cases, in cases in which it should happen, right? In cases in which people who have committed crimes have actually themselves been the victim of crimes, and that's in part why they commit the crime, right? That doesn't happen as often as we would like, but of course it happens. I mean, I don't even... Of course it happens. Well, you're saying... It's, you're saying it's... Are you saying it's never happened, or are you saying that... Or are you saying that it's... Yeah, are you saying that that's never happened, or are you saying that's just that's something that shouldn't happen, or something that uh, that seldom happens? What I'm saying is that with regards to, when we're not talking about racism, white supremacy, it is yeah. rare. It is yeah. extraordinarily rare for me to hear yeah. a perpetrator talked about as the victim of the crime he committed. In fact, I do not ever hear a perpetrator of a crime referenced as the victim of the exact crime that, that he or she committed. I never hear that. When the discussion okay. goes to racism, white supremacy, that is the only time that I hear perpetrators referenced as the victim of the crime they committed. And I find that astounding, and I think it is an act of racism, white supremacy, when white people do it, conscious act of yeah, racism, yeah. white supremacy, because it creates confusion and it creates... Uh, non-white people have been conditioned to empathize with white people. It sets up that dynamic where white, non-white people do not see these white people as perpetrators of the system. Yeah, yeah. They see them as people who are also victims of and duped by that system. I think it is extraordinarily incorrect, and especially because, as I said, in any other situation where we're talking about mistreatment, criminal activity, which white supremacy yeah. is, I don't hear that. I don't hear people going in and saying little John John from the corner who's selling crack is also a victim of crack sales. I don't hear that. You, they certainly that, don't well, that's that really, in the court. Yeah, that, that's really astounding, I have, astounding to me. I, and um, Well, all I'll say is that uh, that's empirically, that, that I believe that statement, well, it's, it's, it's true that you never hear that. It is not true that that's never said. Right, those are two different things. Secondly, I just say that I, yeah, I'm not that I, I'm not that guy. So again, going back to that to that woman, um, that woman I gave who, who doesn't know how to comb her own hair, mm-hmm. I wouldn't say that she's not that. I wouldn't say that. Oh my God, she's not a racist. She should she, she she should be absolved. So you know, I wouldn't say that they shouldn't take her stuff away. I wouldn't say that. I mean, whatever happens to her, she testing that you know racism. You know, and, and actually, it's funny because in some ways. You know, here I actually am taking kind of a, a fuller type line I, I, in that the system of racism and white supremacy it is in some ways, if it is as powerful as people say, there's absolutely no reason why we'd expect that a system like this would just deal with, would just deal with non-whites, would just, would just victimize non-whites. Hmm. Very I mean, interesting. It, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, yeah. So, and now I'm playing with the idea in my head of myself, the what circumstance. So it has to be really, really, so what would have to work for that to, so it would have to be really, 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 really precise to only victimize non-whites, Right. I mean, it had to be incredibly precise, like down to the, yeah, down to the individual, right? No, no collateral damage at all, right? Is that, I mean, I can't imagine, I don't, yeah, I guess it's possible, but I, yeah, I just don't see it like that. Hmm. Um. There is, I guess I'll say, because a lot of people did call, I do want to point out, I do see white people mistreated all the time. White people mistreat white people all the time. 
tons of evidence that that's true. However, yeah. when I say victim of racism, I mean mistreating someone because they're not white. I, I just don't think a white person can be mistreated because they're not white. Logically, I so, don't think that's possible. Okay, so so this is so this is an excellent example. So uh, when when uh, when they create Jim Crow uh, mm -hmm. in the wake of the in the wake of um, you know it, when they destroy Reconstruction, you know they create a number of lo of laws to prevent black people from voting specifically to prevent black people from voting. But in the course of preventing black people from voting, there are all types of white people who can't vote. Now, they're not the same, now they're not the same in number, right? There's no way hell is the same in number. It's, it's predominantly something that deals with blacks. But what would you call, but what, what if we would describe it as racism, you know, as to, as to the reason why black people were withheld, uh, black people's vote were withheld from them, what would, what would be going on with whites? Is that classism, but that's not related to race because they're, because they're white? Or what is that? Uh, well, I mean, just because it's, it's Jim Crow, <laughs> just because it's the system of white supremacy, whatever yeah, happens, if, I, yeah. if I'm a white person, whatever the rules that come down, whatever decisions the most powerful racist white supremacists make, the fact yeah. that I'm white, it's going to be a much different path for me to walk, even if they make rules I don't like, it's going to be very different uh, for me as a white person as opposed to non-white people. So, and, and I'll give you an example. I, and this is an even better example. Um, the Port Chicago uh, mutiny, uh, World War II, um, yeah. Robert Allen had written a book about this. He was on the program as well. Um, he said that Port Chicago explosion, uh, 1944, uh, it destroyed this town, mostly white people. Most, yeah. Mostly the black, the, all the soldiers that were on the cargo ships, most of them were black. Most of yeah. them, not all. Most of them were black. Yeah. But this yeah. town that also experienced a lot of damage, mostly white people. When yeah. Congress went to correct this problem and to give out money for damages and restitution, um, racism, white supremacy. There were white people who were congressmen, suspected racists, who said, yeah. we don't want to give these black people that much money. Give them as little as possible. When they yeah. did this, the end result was that the white people in the town also didn't get all the money that they should have gotten because they were more interested in practicing racism. Now, you, I'm giving you a layup. Bang. You could say those white people uh, in that town... They are victims of racism because of the system of white supremacy being the number one priority. You had a lot of white people, thousands, who, who were mistreated. They didn't get yeah. the amount of restitution that they should have. These are victims of racism. Yeah. I would say that is not true. That is the system of white supremacy means more than even making sure that we do the correct thing by white people. White supremacy means more than anything. Even if some white people are going to be mistreated in this process, that's okay as long as we maintain abuse and domination of non-white people, especially black people. That's okay. I don't think those white people are racist white supremacists because those white people aren't even going out to say, wait a minute, we shouldn't be practicing racism at all. They're not saying we're trying to get off the team. They're just saying don't mistreat us while we mistreat non-white people. Um, so are they? So this is actually so that's actually a good example, but I'm still kind of confused. So they so in the example I use, you know, whites can't, you know, some whites can't vote. And again, it's really a black couldn't vote, but some whites couldn't vote either. And because they couldn't vote, they couldn't get their their economic and political interests met, right? So they were white and they were better than black people, but they couldn't get jobs. They couldn't get it. They um, they they uh, couldn't keep their homes. They couldn't um, start their businesses. They couldn't their whole their whole set of practices that they couldn't engage in. Right. Um, so we can say that they benefited from white supremacy, and as much as they were white, but as far as that specific rule, when when you when whites created a very specific rule to manifest and to reproduce white supremacy. Whites end up being damaged by it. I mean, what would you call them? So you wouldn't call them, you wouldn't call them victims at all. I mean, what would you? I mean, so may, it might just be a language, right? It might just be a language thing. So, like, in, there are certain circumstances. Like, I don't really like to talk about um, victims, but I, I like to talk about people being victimized. I think there's a difference, but um, it could be that type of linguistic thing. 
where you have some term to describe them, but just not victims. Um, but it seems to me that in comparison to other whites who are benefiting, they're losing something significant because they're because they happen to be caught up in some of the same some of the same stuff that non-whites are. What do we call mm. that? Um, I would not call it victims of racism. I, if it's a white person, I believe Tim Wise when he was on the program and I asked him, uh, Tim Wise admitted racist white supremacist. He said. So, white, that, so you got to ask white people. So what white people tell you is... Well, I don't have to. I'm just saying that I have asked yeah. white people yeah. who are yeah. known for talking about racism. Uh, and white yeah. people are more informed about this than I am. So gotcha. I, gotcha. Asked, uh, I have asked white people, and white people have said that they think um, it would be accurate to say that white people are damaged because of the system of yeah. white supremacy. And I, I have no issues with that. That's fine. And I think that is more... Uh, so that is a linguistic thing. Okay, so yeah, oh, so I was, yeah, that's what I was asking. Yeah, yeah. So I, I was, yeah. so so it's just a linguistic difference. So I no, that's that's something different. Yeah, I, I feel you. Okay. Yeah, I just yeah. I think it has huge implications when white people are referenced as victims of racism, uh, just in how non-white people respond to that, the amount of empathy that non-white people uh, exert. Uh, to uh, to empathize with uh, with white people that they think are victims, and as I said before, they tend to take those white people off the t off the hook. They don't think of them as oh, being yeah. complicit as practicing racism. They tend to think of them as victims, uh, so, and, and I don't yeah. even really. So 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 you so you, so we're clear, right? And I, I use another example. So somebody who's damaged can come to my mm -hmm. home. And um and and try to and uh, and threaten me and my wife and I'll still beat the crap out of them. <laughs> right? So okay. you feel me? And, and so and, so when I'm talking about it, I'm talking about it. I am talking about it for the purpose in some ways of building a certain type of politics. But don't sleep. I'm not like okay, let's let these guys off the hook. I mean, you can be damaged as long as the day is long, and I'll still take care of you. I need to, right? So it's, okay. it's just a. So it's just about, for me, it's just about analytical clarity. You know, uh, it's not about, I think you're absolutely right, and there are ways to talk about this that do rob whites of agency. In the same way we began this conversation, I talked about robbing blacks of agency. Um, there is some ways to talk about, that, uh, about racism and white supremacy that do rob white people from, of agency that kind of sort of make it something that, you know, that affects everybody equally and then, because it affects everybody equally, everybody kind of has a responsibility, and then nobody does. Um, I don't, I strive not to talk about it in that manner, even as I believe that whites have been damaged, to use your language, I think that's actually more appropriate, that whites have been damaged by white supremacy. I dig it. I dig it. Um, Again, our guest for today's program, Dr. Lester Spence, uh, Assistant Professor of Political Science at John Hopkins University. Um, are you okay with some questions? Because folks called in. You okay with some questions? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because um, okay. yeah, cause my man is waiting for me. You know? Okay. 478-478, uh, four, seven, four, seven, if you have a question for Dr. Spence, uh, your mic is open. Four, yes, seven, hello. Eight. Um, hello to both of y'all. I am loving the conversation, and I agree uh, with Dr. Spence's point, um, the, the latter point being that, you know, if the system, if we're really saying that the system is all power, then there's, there's not going to be any collateral damage. So I, I, I agree with that. White people just aren't going to, you know, um, I'm just going to have some damaged people as long as I keep my system in place. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that. I think it's a whole bunch of systems, not just this one, um, and it's affecting a lot of people. But as we're talking about racism, I wanted to ask you something because it was noted in the description box, and y'all, you know, we're kind of talking about so many other things. But um, I'm guessing you are saying, Dr. Spence, that there are some benefits to self segregation, and that is what I wanted to hear you speak uh, about more, more so than the, you. you know, what y'all were just doing for an hour and thirty minutes. Yeah, so yeah, what are you these know what? Benefits. What are these benefits? Yeah, 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 and that's actually. Yeah, th thank you for bringing that up, since I appreciate it. So, the, so what I'm able to do when I, for example, hanging out with my fraternity brothers, you know, I'm in a black fraternity, probably like um, 
yeah, the, the Black Fraternity. We were formed in 1911. Um, actually, in DC, where I'm at, where I'm at now. And Andrea with Vision Communication Facilitators. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry, I hope you're having a good day. It's not. Make it better. What just happened? I'm oh, sorry, that's a glitch. Sorry, it was um, someone else. Yeah, someone else called the show line. Sorry yeah. about that. What do I get? You know, I when I'm hanging out with them, I get a. Uh, I'm able to kind of be free of the racial gaze, right? So it's not. I don't have to worry about being uh, surveilled or mistreated because I am black, you know. And, and not only that, there's a certain certain types of conversations that I can have, certain types of ways of being that I can, certain ways of being I can engage in without necessarily having to worry about uh, about being damaged or being. Discussions like discussions like uh, kind of like the ones we're having now, right? Where instead of wondering whether what I say happened really happened, which is you know a discussion we probably have if I was talking about uh, if I was talking about this with a predominantly white audience, we can instead assume that what I said was right and then talk about okay, how do we prevent this from happening again, right? Those are the type of things that having our own spaces allow us to do that I don't think we fully recognize and I don't think we uh, take full advantage of. Thank you. That, that makes sense. And I wanted to know this and get off because I'm pretty sure other people are calling. Um, I, I found it interesting that, you know, when some people speak of justice and you, of course, reference the ancients in my eye, I find it always interesting when we have conversations of race and the word justice comes up that no one really, you know, is really meticulous about what that justice is. And I say that because you seem to be coming from a more, you know, philosophical background when you are referencing my art as far as what the ancients taught as far as universal principles. And I always hear a disconnect when, you know, our people are talking about justice and then when we're talking about universal principles, as you were, you know, making mention to to some of the Caucasian people because I've read so much on ancient cultures and I remember one thing that I read that stated that the um, ancient Egyptians, the Kemetans, turned the Greeks back three times. They didn't even want to teach them any of their, you know, high sciences because they felt the Greeks were too low. So in these conversations, I always wonder um, how were these people able to take down thousands, of, you know, and thousands and thousands of years of civilizations, black people, that were based on these so-called universal principles. Um, it, it's just amazing to me, we, you know, because we talk about racism, which is something very new, and, you know, we just correlate that toward my art and, you know, you know, and civilizations that have lasted for thousands of years. It's amazing to me to see how far that same universal principle of justice that we once had, how we just seem to not even have it anymore. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, and I, I enjoy both of y'all perspectives. Well, thanks a lot, sister. We, we appreciate your comments. I think um, one of the things that um, – that so our, so what? The, our nation is, what, 1776. This is 2010, 224 years. No, 234 years, right? 234 years old. You compare that to, like, the, the ancients, you're talking about a civilization that lasted, like, pretty much, oh, they had, um, they had instances of, like, civil war and, dest and um, instances in which the, the nation was destabilized. But you're talking about something that lasted, like, thousands and thousands of years. And over time, human structures just tend to break down. Even, inst even institutions tend to break down. I mean, as we could see with GM, Ford, and Chrysler, even the, even the big three, you know, break down over time. And one of the things that happens as institutions break down is the ideas and the values that these institutions may not create, but these institutions reproduce tend to break down as well. And that's when you see, like, the meanings of some terms be uh, truncated. So just, justice means a far different, a far narrower set of things 
now than it did back when we were um, back when the ancients were really trying to um, uh, were were really working with the concept in my eye, trying to push it as something that could be used to create a better universe or a better world. Uh, let's see, Cree Seven, counter racist, evolving engineer. If you're with us, uh, your mic should be on. If you have a question for Doctor Spence, I do. Uh, I want to make sure I can be heard and that I'm not blasting folks. Is, are both of those things happening? Yes, ma'am. You are free and clear. Go right ahead. Okay, Doctor Spence, I really appreciate. I actually appreciated the uh, former one, uh, one and a half hours of the conversation because, you know, I really, I think that's one thing that um, we could do more of um, in counter racist science. So I appreciate that your attention to the the definitions, the fundamentals, and so I just had some questions about uh, some definitions, whether or not you would agree that they're accurate. And you know, you were talking about um, the definition that was being spoken about, or as you understand it, as taking away the possibility of. Of, as you called it, agency of black people being able to do anything about their mistreatment. If we were simply to uh, insert the phrase social material, that white supremacy is the most powerful social material force in the known universe, oh, um, wow. would you have a problem with that? Wow, that is an excellent question. And off the rip, me having a long day on a little bit of sleep, I'd say no. I had to think about it a little bit. But what, so what you, what you do when, for the callers, what I hear you say when you make that move is I hear you make a distinction between the, like, the ideational, the stuff we had in our head, I have in our head, and then the material world that we can touch, and then maybe you add on to that, like, institutional stuff. And I'd say, yes, I would be, I would agree with that because that gives us this space from which we can develop, from, uh, from which we can resist, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I think I'd agree with that. I think that's actually, wow, that's really, really excellent. That's brilliant. Hmm. Okay, now can I just ask one more question, host, Gus? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, in, your, in your conversation about institutions, um, the question that I have about it, and I agree with you that institutions are a couple of things. Um, I think fundamentally I agree with the host that it is its people, but I hear you saying, well, it's more than just people, because if you have a hodgepodge of people wanting to get a certain things done, a certain thing done, uh, or things done, that's not the same as an institution or a group of people who have an organized, logical system for getting it done in the most effective, efficient way possible. So I think I agree with both of you. Um, but the question that I have for you, Dr. Spence, is are you saying that there are not people who know institutions principally are rules, people who operate on rules, yeah. you know, people yeah. and then people who know what the rules are and operate them. Are you saying that yeah. those people do not know that rules can be changed and what the effects of changing those rules are? Because I think I've seen yeah. in history plenty of examples of rules being changed and people knowing what the effects of doing that would be. Yeah, um, yeah, changing rules are really, really difficult. And you can have knowledge of changing the rules. Well, so there are two answers to the question. There are some people who actually don't know rules can change. And what I mean, that, I mean, let me see. I mean that both, let me see if I can find an example. Um, like the example I've been working with in my class is uh, like a pickup, like a pickup basketball game. If you think about that, it's kind of a quasi institution. It's a, it's kind of an institution in that we've got certain rules. These rules have been in effect, no matter what the players are. You know, that you bring in, you swap out the ten guys or fifteen guys who play at a given court at a given time. Um, the rules, the fundamental rules, will stay the same, right? You try to. I remember trying to change the rules from a pickup basketball game that I was involved in. All we wanted to do was just change the way that the scoring occurred, right, to change it from, all I wanted to do was change it from 1s to 11 to, like, 2s and 3s to 16 because it made the games quicker. Um, now, that's a rule that we can change. That doesn't fundamentally violate the rules of basketball as we understand them, but it took me three years to get that rule changed, right? Now, is that because people don't know that the rules are cha can be changed? Like, no, that's not necessarily because people don't know the rules can be changed. In part, is because people are, maybe people don't, just don't want to, uh, they don't want to, um, they don't want to change the status quo. They don't want to change the way things are. 
In some cases, it might be that people never thought about changing the rules before, and then there's some other stuff going on as well. So yes, part of it is that people don't know rules can cha be changed, but part of it is uh, part of the um, of it is that um, that the processes themselves kind of make change rule change extremely difficult for reasons other than ignorance. Does that make sense? It does make sense to me. Um, I, I guess my, my question would be, in any given group of people, um, can, can you conceive of anyone being powerful enough and smart enough to, to be able to get the rules changed? Because even in that example that you gave about the, the uh, pickup basketball game, I would imagine that if the most powerful forces of the park or the gym or whatever came down and, and monitored the game and said, from here on, henceforth, the way that you guys do points has been changed, or you will be removed forcibly from the court. I would imagine yeah. at that point, if those people had the power, the, the rules would change. Yeah. <laughs> so it seems like it's a matter of smartness and power. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's a matter of, um, yeah, smartness. It's a matter of power, smartness, and some, yeah, and some other stuff. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. I think that's right. So, I, yeah, I think that's right. Okay. Thank you. No, thank you. That that, that um, it, your questions have been very helpful for. Uh, it's been very, very, very helpful for me. Uh, let's see, uh, Lauren Ashley, also called the uh, program. Did you have a question um, that you want to ask? No. Okay. Groovy, groovy. Um, I know uh, you said uh, you're almost wrapping up there. Could you could you tell us a little bit about the book uh, before we uh, before we lose you? Uh, this program, the book that's coming out in August, "Stare in the Darkness: Rap, Hip Hop, and Black Politics." Could you uh, tell us what we gonna what we should expect from that? Yeah, uh, there are uh, a number of people over the last say 20 years have either argued that rap is going to lead us to a new form of progressive politics, a new black politics, or that it's the greatest threat, that black, a greatest internal threat to black American existence. And what I basically do is I don't necessarily take sides in that question. What I do is basically talk about why people even think that way about rap. either think that it's the best thing since sliced bread politically or I think that it's going to basically send us all to, to hell um, because of its content. And I do that, um, you know, so what I do is I actually, um, using several different, using experiments, surveys, some content analysis, and uh, some organizational analysis, actually study the politics of rap, um, of rap and hip hop's uh, production, uh, consumption, and uh, circulation. Wow, and that's that's uh, supposed to be due out in August. Is that correct? Um, August, not August 2010. It's like it looks like it's going to be spring of 2011. Okay, spring of 2011. Okay, we will definitely make sure to look out for that. I um, man, I I had all prepped. I wanted to talk about uh, the piece that you did on black male privilege and um, yeah. the uh, the piece that you did on what happened with Dr. Gates. Um, like you have so much material on your blog, um, perhaps we can get you to come back and chat with us because I know you're you're going to be continuing your effort uh, with the blog. Um, perhaps we can get you to come back and and chat about more stuff that you've written about and and kind of continue the discussion. Oh yeah, I'm with that man. This has actually been really really helpful for me, and I haven't I haven't thought thought through I haven't thought about the Neely Fuller stuff in years. So this has been a really excellent opportunity for me to revisit that. And then think about it as it relates to institutions. So I'm really starting to be interested in, um, you know, so the agency stuff is one thing, but the institutional stuff is stuff that I've really become interested in um, over the last, say, year or two. And the questions and the discussion has really helped me think, try to think uh, about institutions and white supremacy uh, in a couple of different ways I think will be helpful for me. Wow. Yeah, would love to have you back on the program. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the uh, the discussion. I didn't expect to be talking quite so much today, but uh, yeah, it was great. I, I would love to have you back on the program. Yeah, yeah. And uh, next time, you know, if you if you want, you could you could just press me up on my stuff as opposed to the two way dialogue we had. And I apologize. 
because I, I know a lot of my thoughts weren't necessarily clear. Some of it is because, I, again, I haven't been reading that stuff uh, in a while, but some of it is just because this day has been a long one for me. For, my, for your listeners, I'm usually a lot more um, clear and a lot more um, uh, straightforward and articulate than I've been today. So for that, I apologize. No apologies, sir. I think uh, at least from the folks that called in, you got a thumbs up, uh, and from the host as well, thumbs up. I, I thoroughly appreciated it. Uh, the blog, blacksmith.com. Uh, you can go to that, and from there you can go to the blog, or you can do blacksmith, and it's S-M-Y-T-H-E, blacksmith, S-M-Y-T-H-E dot com forward slash blog. That'll take you to uh, Dr. Lester Spence's blog. Excellent information. I highly encourage it. Um, yeah, we, we, will, we will see if we can work it out and get you back again down the road. Um, thank you so much for sharing some of your Saturday afternoon with us, and uh, continue the excellent work at John Hopkins. Oh, thanks a lot, man. And real quick, tell folks, um, well, I can tell them. You can also follow me on Twitter, at Lester Spence. Twitter at Lester Spence, is that it? Yeah, tw- uh, Twitter.com, and then my, uh, my name on Twitter is, uh, Les- is Lester Spence. Let's use my name. So for those of you oh, who- okay. Yeah, so for those of you on Twitter, follow me. Will do. Will do. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Uh, continue to enjoy the uh, cherry blossoms out there, and uh, we will be in touch soon, sir. All right, man. Peace. Have a good day. Thank you, sir. You too. Uh, context of white supremacy. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back. Uh, share a few uh, thoughts before we wrap the program up. Context. Is racism hurting you? On issues of race, are you unable to speak, think, and act with clarity and confidence? Are you tired of laughing when nothing is funny, smiling when you are not happy, agreeing when you really disagree? Racism.com, you can learn specific strategies and techniques to counter the behaviors of the people who practice racism in all areas of activity. Using words correctly, following counter-racist logic, even counter-racist science projects designed to reveal what racism is, how it works, and how to counter it. The open source code writing format allows you to pick and choose from a variety of counter-racist suggestions so you can produce the code that works for you. Stop by counterracism.com today and help replace racism with justice. That's counter-racism.com. Gus T. Renegade, Context of White Supremacy. Um, I'm sad. This is the first time I got to sit out and do a program. Uh, the first time I've been able to do a program about Side since from card bullet race two thousand. So I'm very thankful the weather has changed. Sunny clouds have come out now, but uh, yeah, great to do a program outside. I look to look to do more of these as uh, the weather gets nicer. Um, I want to take a hot second before uh, this program wraps up. There is a suspected racist. He has a blog. He follows the show. He has been following consistently. Um, I asked him to be a guest on the program. He declined. I asked him if he would put my player on his blog. He has not done that. I asked him if he would link the show. He has not done that. Um, I suspect he's practicing racism, white supremacy in a myriad of ways. One of those ways Uh, He is listening to the program, and he has transcribed whole chunks of Cal's programs, put that on his blog, given credit he did credit with Trump. Uh, He also did a post about Dr. Lester Spence. No problem there. Only issue, he did his post about Dr. Lester Spence within 72 hours of Dr. Elaine Kim being on this program and talking about Dr. Lester Spence, and specifically about the white space, black space article. I strongly suspect that this suspected racist white supremacist 
listened to this program, got that information, added that to his blog. No problem. No problem. But I am going to take time to make sure that I let you know I think you're a racist. I strongly suspect you're a racist white supremacist. Um, what you're doing in your book, I strongly suspect, is racism, white supremacy, and I'll be getting your name out repeatedly. I'm not going to drop the blog, not going to give him any free promotion, but I will get the name out, Macon D. Macon D. I'm very aware that you listen to the program. I suspect you're a white supremacist, and uh, I'll be making sure that other non-white people, if they do find your site, they go with great suspicion because you have a lot of other sites that deal with racism linked on your page that I do not think are constructive at all. In fact, you've got admitted racists plugged on your site, but you're not willing to help promote this program, even though obviously you think it's constructive because you're taking information that's presented here and putting it on your blog. So I want to make sure I call that out. Again, the gentleman, Macon D. That's how he references himself, suspected white supremacist. I'm not going to tell you the blog, though not giving out any free promotion. Making the suspected white supremacist. I see you. Um, if anybody had any comments or questions before we wrap up today's program, this is the first of uh, three programs, three days I'm going to uh, prepare. But if you all have anything you would like to share, feel free. Yeah, I just have a question for you uh, in terms of why I heard the cowbell. Um, the cowbell rang, I believe, twice. The cowbell rang because I felt like for the amount of time that we had to spend talking about whether or not the white woman on the plantation who cannot comb her hair is a victim of racism or if she's damaged about racism, um, being that concerned with white people perhaps being harmed is very reminiscent of thoughts and perceptions that I have observed from not who are sexually involved with white people, um, that level of connection. It, it reminded me of Oreo Writer. That's why I played the clip who is uh, in a sexual relationship with a white person. Um, that it, it, it went on for so long. I, I feel like we spent at least 30 minutes of the conversation discussing that. It went on for so long that it just, uh, <laughs> I almost wanted to ask, like, are you having sex with a white person? Uh, I know he's married to a non-white person, but... Uh, yeah, it, it, there was there was so much of that. Even throughout the interview, I would say, even in the earlier part, the way he talked about uh, the way he talked about the system of racism and white people are ignorant and and these white people don't know. It just it made me think a lot of. I wonder if this person is having sex with a white person. I could be wrong, but that's why the cowbell rung. Okay, okay, that was very consistent. Or maybe he has offspring by you know maybe he has a a baby mama. Uh, that is a white female. So, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Could be incorrect, though. Um, did you have any anything else you wanted to share? I did. I actually thought um, I enjoyed the entire program, and uh, you know, all victims are entitled to their opinions about what they hear in terms of the constructiveness. But I didn't think that it was a uh, I didn't think that it was a waste of time at all. I thought getting to the nitty-gritty of the definitions, you know, if that's what's necessary, because that's where battles are basically fought and won. Um, and it may take a while for it to catch up to you when you don't get those definitions hammered in there. But I really think that when that's not clear, you have to stay with that until it is clear. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to say that. I am. Um, I am. Um I'm just not a nice person anymore working against racism, white supremacy. I wasn't a nice person to begin with, but I, I feel like I make less of an effort, uh, less of an effort to be uh, a nice person, a kind person uh, at this point. Um, if I was, I would say, oh, wow, thanks for the support, Cree. You're great, oh, which you are. But now that I'm all jaded and old and grumpy and victimized, uh, it's, you know, I really don't care if you don't think it's constructive. Don't listen. I have said that repeatedly, uh, and really, uh, just because I'm in a foul mood, uh, and for no reason, because it's nice. I'm sitting outside, and I have a lawn chair, and it's pleasant. Uh, but just system of white supremacy, I'm in a foul mood. Um, for anybody, if you don't think it's constructive, 
I know there are thousands of programs here at Blog Talk Radio. One of them that I think is very constructive, Counter Racist Evolving Engineer. You can check out Free's program. You don't have to hang out and listen to Gus talk crazy and waste your time. Um, in fact, that's a horrible thing to do in my view if you don't think what's happening here is constructive because if you listen to this program, if you have a membership at Blog Talk Radio, it's promoted. Every time you listen to a program, if you have an account here, all of the people that are your friends, they'll get to see, oh, you were listening to the cows. Maybe I should listen to the cows. Maybe they have something constructive. You don't want to do that if what's happening here is not constructive. You're just giving free advertisement to, to foolishness and uh, information that might be confusing or not even helpful at all. wouldn't even be information. Then. It would just be uh, misinformation and foolishness. So don't listen to the program if you don't think it's constructive. If we're wasting your time, Find something else to do. Listen to another program. Cree, that would be one I would suggest. Or Hakima, check out their programs or uh, the thousands of other broadcasts here at Blog Talk Radio. You don't have to hang out at the cows. I would prefer that you didn't if you don't think the program is constructive. Okay, so if I could just uh, plug my show on Wednesday real quick. Um, I was supposed to have William Sandy Darity on last Sunday, and uh, there was a scheduling snafu that turned out to be my error, but he is coming on. He's confirmed for Wednesday, this Wednesday, Eastern Standard Time, or Eastern Daylight Time, 7.30 p.m., which is 6.30 Central and 4.30 um, Pacific. And so that will be this Wednesday, March 31st at those times. And uh, Darity uh, has done lots and lots, of, lots and lots of research on economics, um, use of time and labor as it uh, relates to color and even like increasingly darker shades of color um, in the marriage market, if that's uh, economics, but also just in the workplace. So I'm really looking forward to, um, to talking with him. Outstanding. Could you give us the date and time again, please? Sure. It's March 31st, this Wednesday, at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, 6.30 Central, and 4.30 uh, Pacific. Counter-racist, evolving engineer. I will be there this Wednesday, uh, white people permitting. I will right. be there this Wednesday, um, hopefully with no hiccups. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess... Uh, I, I thought uh, Miss Ashley was here, but uh, apparently her internet is uh, being a little niggerish, and she uh, dropped out. She's she's still chatting away, but she's not connected. Um, yeah, I was gonna do it. I told her to prepare. I was gonna do it, but I don't I don't feel the uh, the need to do so at this time. Forgive the plane passing overhead. I am outside. Um, we were gonna chat about uh, Flash Forward because they had uh, an incredible episode that aired this week. Um, number one, it was incredible because Gabrielle Union was in it a lot. <laughs> number two, it was incredible because Gabrielle Union's character is a lawyer in Flash Forward. She became very aggressive in working against the mistreatment of a non-white person. This led her to being very aggressive in the way she began talking to white people. Very interesting dynamics happened on the program. You had non-white people who were attempting to get her to stop questioning these white people and to stop trying to get information. She went and talked to the white person. Very aggressive conversation with this white person. Um, she ended up calling these white people suspects. She got very uh, precise about language. This is a suspect. This is a sus I mean, mm -hmm. incredible program. Uh, the racism was just all over the place. Um, Lauren and I will have to do this update because it, it was enough that warranted uh, quite a bit of conversation. Um, yeah, flash forward. Watch flash forward, guys. Watch flash. Forward. If if you are a, a black male, non-white male, you can watch and enjoy Gabrielle Union, right? And you can pay attention to the racism because there is tons of it. Watch flash forward. Lauren and I will do that. Uh, we'll do that soon. We'll make time to do that soon, but not today. Um, yeah. I think uh, I'm going to put my feet up on the plantation and uh, prep for tomorrow's program. Miss uh, Aisha Sekhmet, uh, that's tomorrow, 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, she'd be very interesting. Uh, she is an artist and activist. Um, she'd be, uh, I hope, a constructive broadcast. And again, on Monday, Jesse Daniels, white 
female author of Cyber Racism. Uh, that program will air at 5 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Pacific. Context of white supremacy. Gus T. Renegade, uh, thank you all for tuning in. I hope it was constructive. Our guest today, Dr. Lester Spence, assistant professor at John Hopkins. Check out his website again, Blacksmith. Smith is S M Y T H E. Blacksmith.com. Uh, excellent information. Uh, we will be back tomorrow. Thank you all for uh, tuning in for the show, Replace White Supremacy with Justice as soon as possible. Thank you.